much. It's great to be here in Sebring. And, you know, my wife and I, we, we uh, drive through here. Our son played baseball at a community college, and we would drive through here, but we never had the, the chance to stop and, and meet some folks. So it's great to be here. And man, I'll tell you, we're having church, aren't we? <laughs> this is like church. Thank you so much for that message and your prayers. And so I would just like to start with a prayer. This, this is a prayer breakfast. Uh, let, let's pray. Father God, the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord God, we invite you this morning, O Holy Spirit, to be here with us. Lord, as we come before your throne, we cast ourselves down, and we ask you to cleanse each one of us this morning. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit, and Lord, use us this day, direct us, lead us this day. And Lord, now bless us with your Holy Word. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Well, I, I would like to uh, talk a little bit this morning about a film uh, I'm doing. I, I've had the privilege of, of being involved with the film called Monumental uh, with Kirk Cameron, as Helen said. And for me, it's really been a, a personal journey of discovery. And I think it is for really for everybody who's a Christian who calls upon the name of the Lord. Once you get the message of this, and we're going to show a clip about it in a little bit here. But the grand concept of this film that we've been working on in two years, and I've, I've got to know Kirk Cameron and work with him day in, day out, and um, it, it's an amazing discovery for all of us because we realize getting into this, this is not a, a cure for cancer, or this was not a solution to fix our ailing economy. It wasn't that kind of film. But the discoveries that we've made in this film are so profound. They're so deep-rooted. And they're awe-inspiring. It kind of gave all of us a wake-up call halfway through this. We didn't realize it. You know, imagine if a coded map could be deciphered and found that would uncover a true national treasure that could jumpstart the economy, that could actually bring true prosperity back to our land, that would feed the hungry, bring families out of po poverty and where people could own their own land and farms without usurious mortgages. Where is such a map like this? Where does such a map exist? Is it beneath a cathedral in New York, like we've seen in that movie? Or is it beneath a lake in South Dakota somewhere? We believe we've actually discovered a coded map, if you will. It's a treasure that sits prominently on a forgotten hill, surrounded by old homes and trees, in the little college, of, college town of Plymouth, Massachusetts. Here in 19th century, America's Americans worked, they worked for 70 years to, to build this monument. It actually started during the, the administration of George Washington. And it was interrupted by the Civil War and it took them 70 years to build this monument. It's called the National Monument to Our Forefathers. And I'd like to share a little bit about the message from the monument this morning, what it, what it means if we, as we've heard about the foundations of America. Consider for a moment the importance of monuments throughout history. The earliest recorded history monuments have, they've kind of been roadmaps. They've been kind of the keys to unlocking treasures of civilizations throughout time. The ancient monuments of the world, they give us a link to the, the treasure that's kind of most desired from civilization to civilization. It gives you a roadmap. Take Egypt, for example. Just one example. They devoted their full energy in Egypt of building these pyramids. Some of you have probably been there. I haven't been to Egypt yet. That's one thing I'd like to do. But in the case of Egypt, you know, they built these, these pyramids that still stand today. And they show us what the Egyptians were taught to treasure. 
Think about it. These guys dragged 12 ton stones miles and miles through the desert and piled them up in the desert for the life of one man after he died. That's what they did. That's what their treasure was. But, folks, there's another type of, of monument it, that's a keeper of the past. And it's a key that can really unlock the hopes of future generations. And I'd like to give you a biblical example here. These monuments, these types of monuments, were actually inaugurated by the ancient Hebrews. Their God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he told them, when they entered the promised land, to build a memorial. A memorial of remembrance. So when the grandchildren ask, what is this monument? What does it mean? What are these piles of stones here? What does it mean, Grandpa? The fathers could tell them how the Ark of the Covenant was lowered into the Jordan River and how the waters parted and how it allowed millions of the Hebrews to enter the Promised Land. After these people crossed over on dry ground, you know the story. We heard part of it already. God told them to bring a, bring a representative of each of the 12 tribes and to get a stone. Each guy, get a stone, bring it out, pile it up and put it on Mount Gilgal for a remembrance so they wouldn't forget. Somebody said that this morning, that we forget. The monument that provided a code so that the grandchildren wouldn't forget to tell the story of God's power so they could remember the one true treasure that really existed which was to be found in the, the one true God who parted the Jordan River so they could enter into the land of, of promise. You know, we, like our ancient Hebrew friends, we have lost our way. We, like these ancient people, we've, we need the landmarks. We need them now because it, it, it points us a way back. You know, the story of America's national treasure starts with a small shipload of families known as the Pilgrims. And they set foot in New England on a rock what is today called Plymouth, Massachusetts. The small group of families, they knew the unchanging proven strategy that produced the richest, freest nation in the history of the world, the United States of America. They knew it. They had the treasure of America's future, not in chests of gold on the ship or in armies or, or strong armies, but they had it inside their chests. In their very soul, they had it. It's interesting that in the same year that the Constitution was ratified, our Constitution, that a powerful rainstorm poured into that forgotten little village and Massachusetts on a place called Cobbs Hill and on Cobbs Hill just above Plymouth Rock there as we stood there we realized this is where the ancient remains the bones of the pilgrims that died in their first winter in 1620 exploded onto the scene and when the people in the village seen it they repented and they said oh my gosh we've forgotten the sacrifice they've made we forgot what they did for us how they saved our nation. And at that point in time, the people in the village, they got together and they prayed, and they, like the ancient Hebrews, they decided to build a memorial that still stands today in Plymouth, Massachusetts. You know, more people have been freed. More have been brought out of poverty and despair by the landing of these people that we call the pilgrims, than any other group of people except Christ the Lord, who is the author of liberty. You know, the more I study this subject, the more I believe that the, the story of our God-given rights is really the true missing link to revive our nation again. You know, the story of liberty reaches its crescendo with the 
Mayflower Compact and the landing of the pilgrims 400 years ago. But the story begins in Nazareth, when Christ, the author of liberty, he gave his first sermon to his home synagogue. His story is detailed in Luke chapter 4. You can read it later in the day. He says he came, he, when he said he came, when he came to the scroll, he opened the scroll to Isaiah 61, and he read the messianic prophecy of the purpose of the Messiah's coming, as he read it there. He detailed that he came to heal the brokenhearted, the blind, and preach the gospel to the poor. But when he came to the subject of liberty, he said he came to set the captives free. And then he repeated it a second time, saying he kept to set them, those free that were in bondage. When he finished reading that day, the prophet, he, Christ sat down and he told the people, he said, the prophecy has been fulfilled in your midst. The liberation of planet Earth began that day. And Christ unleashed this loving message of redemption that brought the power and the principles to our nation. Folks, we're standing for the crown rights of King Jesus in every institution. Every institution. Not just church, but out there in the culture, in politics, in the economy. So how do we get back on track? What, really, how do we get back? At, look, we've got to be honest with ourselves. What is the solution? How do we find a solution so we don't lose our liberty? How do we do it? I'd like to share with you just, uh, Mike is going to play a little clip of the film here for a few minutes, okay? Here we go. There are those who would have us believe that the United States has reached the zenith of its power, that we're weak and fearful, reduced to bickering with each other. I don't agree that our nation must resign itself to inevitable decline. America is the richest, freest nation the world has ever seen. But as a father of six, I look around and all signs tell me something is sick in the soul of our country. And history tells me that we're headed for disaster if we don't change our course now. The set of ideas that is being implemented and advanced in this capital at this time is terribly frightening to people who are students of history. If you look at the 70 superpowers in history, every single one of them has called themselves exceptional. When you look at the Roman Empire, the parallels to what is going on in America are absolutely frightening. And the question is, are we going to go the right path ourselves, or are we going to continue down the wrong path that so many nations have fallen into? I went on a journey to retrace the footsteps of our forefathers to see if they left us some kind of a map that would guide us back to the foundation of America's success. When I think of pilgrims, I think of what I was taught in history class. I think of pilgrims coming over in these funny black and white suits with big hats and belt buckles on their shoes. <laughs> these are the people out of the box. These are the radicals of the day. Can you imagine? Chained here, and you're open to the elements. You can read about places like this. You can smell the history. You can't fight this. Welcome to Mayflower 2. So we have 102 people yeah. in this area. Look at that. I mean, can you imagine you're going to be sharing that? It's actually quite comfortable. <laughs> What I discovered is that our history has not just been forgotten, it's been rewritten. I'm stunned just what's on this table. I mean, this alone would, would change everyone's perspective about what made America such a great nation. Time is flying by too quickly, and our children's futures won't wait. We've got to do something now. Why is this monument not being showcased more? It is illustrating the principles of what this country is all about, and it's falling apart. There is nothing in today's America that cannot be solved by a genuine going back to the American first principles. That's good news. Very good news. I'm looking for good news. This is the most important journey of my life. My family is worth fighting for, and so is yours. By the way, this... Uh film will be released March 27th. Okay. But, uh, you know, as you've seen here, as Kirk explained, our forefathers, they had the foresight. And they left us this road map that shows on this largest granite monument in America 
you know, so we wouldn't forget this proven strategy. And that would create a path that would lead us to a treasure, really. A treasure that founded this great nation. You know, <laughs> I remember one day we were standing there and Kirk said to me, he said, you know, this monument is so blatantly Christian, it's, it's surprising it's not illegal. <laughs> you know, in, t in today's world. I can tell you, the ACLU hates this monument. I mean, it's so obvious, the message from it. And the words on it, we're going to just cover a little bit this morning, but the words on it really inspire you to restore your faith in God. And you see the courage and the sacrifice. Uh, that these people made when they came over here in the winter of 1620. You know, we started asking the question, who were these, these people that built this nation? We heard a little bit about that this morning already. So we did take a journey back. We went to England and Scotland and Holland. It was a great tr trip over there for a couple weeks to try to discover, really search who these people were. And we had historians over there that took us around. And what we discovered is that these were brilliant people. It thought out of the box, and they were willing to risk everything. They saw themselves as created for a specific purpose, really, and that God had placed them on the world to accomplish a certain task at a point in time. They actually knew that they were a new link in this chain of liberty that was being forged on that tiny Mayflower ship as it was tossed in the ocean coming over here 66 days. Could you imagine that with the children sick, every, all the kids are crying, everybody throwing up, everybody's sick. Kirk made a little joke about it that it was comfortable. Trust me, it was not comfortable. And their pastor, Pastor John Robinson, what a great man of God. This was the pilgrim pastor, John Robinson. And one of the great things that he said, you know, that always stuck in my mind, he said to his people, he said, believe in the future that God has ordained. God is sovereign. He's going to take care of us. And they planted, he planted that thought in their mind, and that's why they came over. We're going to start here with faith. There she is. The center. This is called the National Monument to the Forefathers. You can see faith. She's pointing to heaven. And the reason is to show there's only one way to God, through Christ the Lord, to show their belief. She's holding the Geneva Bible that the pages are being blown open by the wind. And uh, it, she's got on her head, you can't see it real well, but there's a, a little star up there to show that the mind could be led by Scripture and governed by Scripture. You know, the, the pilgrims brought the Geneva Bible over with them on the Mayflower when they came here to show that they had faith in God. I mean, obviously, that's, that's evidence. And, you know, there, there's thousands of historical proofs that back up this monument that were... We're researching right now, and we continue to research. But they clearly show one thing, and they prove that faith in God of the Bible was the core foundation of what they believed. They knew that Christianity produces liberty. They understood that, that it only came from Christ, because its founder was Christ. Morality is our next, uh, Mike is going to move it over. There's morality. Now, this is kind of obvious. She's holding the Ten Commandments, shows how a person is to live. And she, uh, she is also, uh, she had, you can't see it, but she's holding a sc scroll of Revelation in her other hand that would show that ungodliness would continue in the world that Pastor talked about, that spiritual warfare. The collar of morality around her neck there shows that every Christian could be a priest before Christ, that you didn't have to go through anybody. You could go directly to God yourself. Now, faith and morality, these two symbols, they symbolize the internal liberty that we all need first, right? We need that first. We need that. And that's, by the way, that's why her eyes, she don't have eyes. That's to show she's looking inward to her heart and her soul. And th this shows that what they were trying to show with this was that we need this internal liberty first before we have external liberty in our education, our laws, etc. Okay, so next we're going to go to law. He's, the, he's got these powerful eyes there. Look at him. 
You know, the pilgrims believed that all were equal before the law, including the king, right? And they knew from their past experience that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. They lived through this. And many of their laws came right from the Bible, right from Scripture. There's a great philosopher named Chesterton. He said, you know, we either have to choose between the the Ten Commandments or the Ten Thousand Commandments. And it's an interesting point. You know, somebody made the observation, there's so many criminal laws in our country at the different levels of government that the odds of no one breaking one in a lifetime is so astronomical, it would even take DNA odds to look like simple math. We got so many laws. We're creating all these laws for everything. There's going to be a new law in Florida you can't text. When you're driving. Now, maybe that's a good law, you know, but how many, you know, how many laws do you have where you got little losses of liberty over and over and over? You know, it's interesting that the Bible teaches that a nation's monetary policy is tied to the concept of just, just weights and measures, mm -hmm. as seen in our monument and clearly taught in, in the law of God. You know, inflation easily perverted paper money. Did you know that in scripture that's called the treasure of wickedness in the book of Micah? You know, emperors have been in search of, of true wealth since the beginning of time, especially gold. And, you know, in addition to pillaging and murder and theft, and they resorted to hiring sorcerers, alchemists, who promised a scientific formula to create gold out of base metals. But we know that real gold takes discovery, digging, refining before it's useful. You know, we've elected, unfortunately, for some, as some of our representatives today, people who are really political alchemists, who promise to create wealth and then fulfill these promises by the printing of worthless paper money. This is not the strategy that built America. It's fool's gold. It's a counterfeit. Yeah. Education is our next symbol. There she is. You know, this is simple, right? Train, child, away they go. They don't depart. Show the responsibility of mother in the home with her children, teaching her children. She's wearing that wreath of learning around the top of her head to show the, the high expectation they had for the youth. You know, the, when the pilgrims were in Holland, they lived there about 12 years. Their lives were hard, but they had jobs, and they, it was tough, real tough. But the main reason they left is the kids were getting polluted by the culture, and the parents seen it happen. The main reason these pilgrims came here were the kids. The kids were being infected by the, the culture at that time. You know, in contrast, we, me included, we sent our children to these liberal colleges. I mean, think about it. We have 11,000 courses today in our universities on ethics. We have business ethics. We have legal ethics. We have medical ethics. But these 11,000 courses on ethics didn't fix the problem. It exacerbated the problem because they're teaching relativistic ethics, that there's no right or wrong. It's just whatever you think it is. And conversely, the ethical problem in our nation worsened. Shame on us. So what we need to, what we're trying to present in Monumental in this film is at a whole different level. It really is. The goal was to rediscover the forgotten national treasure of America. And the treasure that we have discovered is the divine, timeless, proven strategy that produces freedom, liberty, when lived out through willing, Yes, and perfect servants of God. We've 
discovered. It's a rediscovery, really. It's been forgotten 100 years. Left for us by our ancestors on a monument. You know, it's interesting. You could walk, you could walk up within 100 yards of this and not see it today. It's covered by trees that have grown up. It's like it's almost intentional to hide it. And it's not taken care of. We hope if we, if we do get some money back on this film, we're, we're going we're gonna to restore this as best we can with our funds. That's what we're going to do. But, you know, Christians, we've heard this this morning. We've been taught to separate from the culture for 100 years. But the good news is this morning that the liberty men and women are waking up. Our solution, this national treasure, is exemplified in the liberty man. He's our next symbol here. I'll tell you, I relate to this guy. Look at this guy. This isn't a guy you want to mess with. You know, he's like an athlete preparing for, for a battle. He's not in, adhering to his, his intense diet and training just for the fun of it. He's got a big vision, a big purpose. You know, we're not doing this film really to be nice guys, per se. It's really a big vision. Kirk Cameron has a big vision here, a big purpose. So do I. You know, Christ told us, he told us to make the nations my disciples. He didn't give us an exercise in futility, but a command to be fulfilled. Amen. It just has to be done his way. Yeah. can't be done our way. Amen. He's got a way to do it, and he shows us here. It's got to be through, right, the transformation of the heart, right? The bottom up. You can't have forced submission by a government or a tyranny, a top-down solution. It doesn't work. It's got to be in each one of us first. This ideal man, this liberty man, there he is. Look at him. He's not only seen here on this monument, but we've seen him throughout time, throughout history. He's appeared over and over again throughout history. And he's seen the, the problem. By the way, this includes women, liberty women. We see the problem, we repent. And by God's example, the example of Christ, millions are liberated. Take a walk with me for a minute through, through time as each of the following David and Goliath stories show the battle between good and evil, liberty and tyranny throughout time. Against all odds, this liberty man has stood against evil and defeated the enemy. You know, it's the same song, different verse. Good versus evil, liberty versus tyranny. In each of the following examples, you're, you're going to see a pattern emerge here. First, the tyrant rises up. He takes as much as he can, steal, wealth, power, through deception, lies. But then the liberty man, the liberty woman, comes to the rescue and liberates. You know, tyrants are a representative of the thief that comes to steal kill and destroy, right in the book of John 10.10. 10. In that same verse, the liberty man is a representative of Christ who came to give life abundantly. It's shown in that same verse of Scripture. You know, tyrants, they promise benefits, but they deliver crushing taxes, yeah. confiscation of property, laws without justice, True persecution of <clears throat> believers, the persecution of true believers. You know, that's what eventually follows in every nation throughout time. But the contrasting sons of God burst forth because the truth of God's word is in them. And they stand for liberty even when faced with persecution or death. Of course, it all begins with the triune God and the word of God, and their plan to liberate planet Earth. Then Moses steps on the threshold of history. This liberty man of, e of Israel, the founder of the Hebrew Republic, he brings the people the Ten Commandments. And then Christ the Lord, the God-man, the one who made the stars as scintillating lan lanterns in the sky, the one who rose from the grave, 
the author of liberator, of liberty, the liberator and the only savior of the world, the living word, the day spring on high here in Sebring this morning. That's who he is. And the creator of the liberty man. When he was enthroned to rule the earth, until his enemies would be made his what? His footstool. Not longer after his resurrection, the gospel was preached. And the, the known world got this message. They got the gospel. And nations began to rise. You know, I just dropped by this morning to tell you that Jesus is Lord. Yeah. He is Lord. And, you know, centuries pass and time goes by and we're about to celebrate in a couple weeks here St. Patty's Day. Now, some people will celebrate it more than others. I hope you're not one of those. But St. Patrick, take this was a liberty man. I mean, he, he was a missionary to England and he civilized the Emerald Isle himself. He was the first person in history to eliminate slavery in that nation. He brought order through handwritten Bible passages that he had all his helpers pass out. He baptized 150,000 people. The tyranny rose up. The cruel Vikings, they ravaged Europe. And they just almost destroyed Christianity in the 8th and 10th centuries. But a liberty man named Alfred the Great, he fought 54 hand-to-hand -hand battles with the Vikings. <laughs> And he unites England. He codified, he wrote down common law in the Ten Commandments. Tyranny rose up. King John, he terrorized England. He plunged, he plunged the people into wars and he confiscated their property. Even starvation. He created huge taxes. But the liberty man, the people of England, and a man named Stephen Langdon, they codified, they wrote down a document in 1215 called the Magna Carta. And it said that there was a rule of law even over the king, that the king had to abide by. This Christian document in 1215 ultimately led to the English Bill of Rights and our own constitution. Tyranny rose up. There he was, King James. He wanted control. And Elizabeth, too, in spite of the movie that you've seen, that was inaccurate. They wanted to control all of life. They killed or exiled anybody who stood for liberty. They ignored all the liberty documents before them. But the liberty men, the people that our film is about, the pilgrims, they stood against these tyrants, and they obeyed God's word. They started their own home church. And you know what? For that, for that one thing, they were forced to choose one of the three things that are about to happen. Death, imprisonment, or exile for starting the home church. But by their peaceful example, in the documents like the Mayflower Compact, they set the stage for America's freedom. Their governor, William Bradford, he established the free enterprise system that we have to. So we can have a prayer breakfast here today. We can have kids come and help and go to a store later and buy something. Governor Bradford realized the system that they were handed didn't work and the agreement. So he assigned to every family a parcel of land that they could cultivate on their own and work with their own hands and get the rewards of it. This concept of free enterprise it initiated a new era in America for the first time. Tyranny rose up again, and there he was, King George. He began to terrorize the people in America and the colonies through illegal power grabs, taxes, stealing property. But the Liberty Men, the Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, and other Liberty Men, such as Samuel A. Henry, who we heard about this morning, George Washington, in an army of believers, they stood firm against tyranny. They held their ground. But you know something? They fought a defensive war. They didn't go on the offense so much. It was a defensive war to protect their families and their homes. 
That's what they did. Their children, the tyrants of the evil empire, tyranny rose up again, the USSR. In the Cold War, it almost called for world destruction. It was a terrible thing. Confiscated private property again. They killed millions of their own people. It lasted 40 years. Some of you probably lived through the whole thing. They enslaved almost one-third of the world's population one way or another. The Cold War. But the Liberty Man, Ronald Reagan, he stood against the odds. He was the point man. Reagan was the point man peacefully dismantling this evil empire. You know, we interviewed Michael Reagan. We had the chance to go talk to Michael, the son, at the Reagan Ranch. And he shared a story I never knew about. Ronald Reagan, when he was shot one month after he was in office, had a wake-up call, big time, a spiritual wake-up call. He realized God had a calling on his life. And when he got out of the hospital, he went to his Oval Office, and he got down on his knees and he prayed. And God showed him real clear that he was the point man to be used to dismantle the USSR. God caused that bullet to get to Reagan for a reason. God is sovereign. Even some of the, you know, and he transforms things. You never notice that about our God? He turns the bad stuff into good. He does it. You know, I'm going to wind up here in a little bit. I don't want to run over too much. But, you know, there was a, a British historian, Niall Ferguson. He made this very interesting point. He said that it's not so much our external liberties that we have that drive our culture into decline. He said that, you know, the threat is posed is not with the rise of China or Islam or CO2 emissions, but by our own loss of faith in the civilization we inherited from our ancestors, that we've forgotten what they gave us. And that's why the message of this monument is so important. It's not the monument. It's the message. Our Liberty Man, there he is. He's this symbol of this transforming monumental strategy unleashed throughout all the ages. Paul said it namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. See, our Liberty Man, he, he rests in the, in the providence of God. And over time, he defeats or his children defeat the enemy through faith, intelligent action, a loving character, charity. Those are all good Christian things, aren't they? He's the real man, though. If he has to fight, he will. But there's no other warrior compared to him. You know why? Because he already knows when no other warrior knows that the victory has been won. So... The spiritual battle that we heard about earlier that the liberty man is engaged in. I want to tell you some other. If you're a born-again Christian, you're in the battle. It exists from now on. It's an all-out war. There's no cease fire. There's no cessation of hostility. It doesn't exist. It exists from now on. There's no temporary. Don't ever let the evil one think you there's a temporary truce. There's no such thing with him. He ain't going to stop. He, that's how we get sucked in sometimes. We think things are cool. It's all right for a while. Baloney. He's scheming. He's, he's deceitful. That's what he does. But these, see, this is it. The liberty men and women, we need to be constantly strengthened by the Lord. More precisely by his mighty power. Now, don't miss this. Please. The liberty men and women were to fight this battle with, which is a, with a strength that is not our own, really. Just as we're justified by a righteousness that is not our own, the righteousness of Christ, we're to fight this battle with the strength that is not our own. It's the power and might of Jesus Christ. That's how you fight the battle. 
This liberty man is free in his heart. He looks free sitting there, don't he? He's free in his heart because he's constantly cleansed. And he's filled by Christ the Savior. He bows before the morality of Scripture because he realizes the roots of the American Republic were planted on Mount Sinai. Those precepts were given there. And the eternal principles of truth, justice, and the sovereignty of God are played out. He uses these laws planted at Mount Sinai as the foundation for civil government, true civil government, personal freedom. He applies these laws to create just institutions to protect the innocent among us. That's why abortion is so bad. He prioritizes his life to educate his children because he sees a responsibility to pass this on generationally to the next generation. I'll tell you, the liberty man is the man. He is the man. He has this calm assurance within him. He has the power of the might of the king of kings within him. That's where he gets his power. And this is the same man, the liberty man, that will save America. Now, where are we going to find him? Where are we going to find this guy? Where is he today? He's in the hearts of men and women who are fully devoted to God yes. and his law. Yes. Okay? Devoted to God and his law. That's where you'll find this person. Okay? Recognize your connection this morning. Don't leave here without recognizing your connection to this. You are the liberty men and women. You are. You, 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 you are the liberty of men and women. It's not somebody else. It's not Rambo or the Terminator or Wonder Woman coming to save you. It's you. It happens in you first. And then once it happens to you, you bring it to your family, to your church, and to your town. And the whole city's liberated. You know, folks, as I'm winding up, I know this for sure. We can improve America. You know why? People made it what it is, and we can make it what it ought to be. Christians believe that. I believe it. Paul said it. What did he say? I could do all things through Christ. I believe that. Don't you? I believe it. You know, as I close, I wonder what many people will say to their children or their grandchildren someday when they say, you know, Dad, where were you when America lost its freedom? What were you doing? What did you do to stop that, Grandpa? What were you doing when God turned away, when people turned away from God? What were you doing, Grandpa? You know what? I believe you're going to have a good answer to those questions. I believe you will. Because you'll protect the God-ordained family when you leave here. You're going to protect Christian liberty in the public square, just like this prayer breakfast. This is an example of Christian liberty in the public square. Next year, invite 10 people. This place should have 1,000 people next year. Every one of you, I'm looking at you, invite 10 people. Invite 10 people. Will you do that? Let's make this a great big prayer breakfast. My friends, every age, every history shows as proof, as clear as the light of the morning. If there be soul, life, the spirit of liberty, and the sons and daughters of America, protect it. Stand up as one for your liberty. If you do, this will be our finest hour. This will be it. And so I will end with this. The Bible, the great book, teaches that there's two stops on this train that we call life that people get off. Yes, there are. There are. There's this train of life that we're all currently on that it only has two stops at the end of the track. One is heaven, which is joy unspeakable, a beautiful place. 
and the other is hell for all those whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But I'll tell you, the Liberty sons and daughters, they ain't looking for the undertaker. They're looking for the upper taker. We can only enter heaven one way, folks. You know that. By believing in Christ the Lord. Through his shed blood on that cross, dying for our sins. The narrow gate. You're going to hear all these other ways. There ain't no other way. He's the only Savior of the world. He's your Savior, my Savior, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father but by me. God bless you. Thank you for inviting me. God bless Seabrook. Thank you.